In the Bioinformatics from Scratch series and several other drug discovery videos, we made use of a software called the Paddle Descriptor, which was used for calculating molecular fingerprints of molecule that are then used for machine learning model building. And it is worth to note that the Paddle Descriptor software is a Java software, which typically will require us to run Java and then the jar file shown here. That process might require you to download the Paddle Descriptor zip file and then set up a bash command from within Python, which might be a bit tricky or complex. In this video, we're going to take a look at the Python library called PaddlePy, which we're going to use for calculating the molecular fingerprints natively in Python. And so there won't be any need to have to download the jar file and then use the bash command because now we could run it natively in Python. And so this will be very convenient if we're using Google Colab because we could just pip install it and then use the functionality for the molecular fingerprints calculation. And so without further ado, we're starting right now. So we're going to calculate the molecular fingerprints using the PaddlePy Python library. So the first thing that you want to do is install it via pip install. And then the next part is we're going to have to download the fingerprint XML file because in order to calculate the 12 different molecular fingerprints, we're going to need the XML because that file will give us the information pertaining to the molecular fingerprints that we're going to calculate. And so I have it hosted here in the fingerprints xml.zip file. And if you unzip it, you're going to see the file shown inside the paddle descriptor folder here, which is shown here in the XML file. You're going to see 12 of them, right? And so we're going to use only the XML file. So let me take a look at the XML file and show you. So essentially it is having the pubchem value of true because this is the pubchem fingerprinter.xml. So pubchem will have a value of true and everything else will have a value of false. So this file will tell the paddle descriptor software that we're going to calculate the fingerprint for the pubchem. And if we click on another one, like for example, if we click on Clicoda rot fingerprint count, you're going to see that the Clicoda rot fingerprint count will have a value of true and the other values will be false for the other molecular fingerprints. And so this will be the same for the other 10 different molecular fingerprints. So for your convenience, I have already zipped it up and it is in the paddle repository inside the fingerprints xml.zip file. So all you need to do is use the wget command to download the file, and then we're going to unzip it. Let's run that, and let's do this. Let's list all of it of the XML file, and then we're gonna sort it, and now it's all sorted up, and then we're going to create a list with the shortened version of it, because next step is we're going to create a dictionary where we're gonna make use of the shortened version as the key in a dictionary, and then the value will be the, the full name of the XML file. And now let's create the dictionary. And so the dictionary here is called the FP variable. And so for example, if you want to call Adam's pair 2D, let me show you. You could just type in FP, and because it is a dictionary, we're going to do this. Adam pairs 2D, and then we're going to get the value. Okay, so Adam pairs 2D, the one here is the key, and then the value here is the value. Okay, so whenever we call the key, we're going to get the value. And so that will come in handy in just a moment. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. All right, and so here we're going to download the HCV data sets. And so this is for the hepatitis C virus. So we have published a paper about this already. So let's import pandas as pd, and we're going to use the pd.readcsv function in order to read the csv file of the data set. And then we're going to assign it to the df variable. And finally, we're going to take a look at the first two rows of the data frame. And so here you have it. You have the first column to be the Chambo ID, followed by the canonical smiles. So we're going to make use of both columns here in order to prepare the input file for the paddle descriptor calculation. And then afterward, we're going to take a look at the last column, the activity, which is active or inactive. And the activity is actually the bind value of the standard units here. I mean, the standard value here. So 1.4 is the nanomolar value. And then we calculated the 
PIC50 value here, as shown here. And then we applied the threshold of five and six, whereby if it has a PIC50 greater than six, we're gonna classify it to be active compound, shown here. And let me show you the tail part of the data frame because that will give you the inactive compound. So we're gonna take a look at the last few rows of the data frame, and you're gonna see that it is inactive. And let's have a look at the PSC50. So it is less than five, so therefore it will be inactive. All right, so the actual nanomolar value will be very high, it's shown here, okay? And so in order to calculate the molecular descriptor using Paddle, we're going to have to prepare the input file. And the input file is very simple. It's going to be comprised of two columns. The first column will be the canonical smiles, and the second column will be the name of the molecule, which is the Chembo ID in our situation here. And so let's run this line of code. And so it will essentially do a subset of the prior data frame. It's going to select only the canonical smiles and the Chembo ID. And then it's going to sort it a bit. It's going to have the canonical smile as the first column and then the Chembo ID as the second column, as shown here. So we order it according to here. And then we're going to merge it using the pd.concat function, and then we're going to write it out as a tab delimited file because we use the separator to be slash t, which is an input argument for the two CSV function. Because if we don't put the separator here, it's going to write out the CSV file format. And very important here is that the output file will be called molecule.smi. And make note here that we're going to leave out the index. So index will be false. And then we're going to leave out the header. So header will also be false. And then we run this line. And then let's have a look at the FP dictionary again. And as I have already shown you, if we would like to calculate the PubChem, we're going to save FP PubChem, and then we're gonna retrieve the name of the XML because the PubChem fingerprinter.xml will contain the information that the Paddle descriptor software needs. Let me show you in the block of code here. So here we're going to import the Paddle descriptor function from the PaddlePy. Okay, so the Paddle descriptor function will be equivalent to us running java-jar, J-A-R, paddle descriptor dot jar, and then we're going to have to invoke several other commands. So let me show you how we would do it if we're not using the paddle pie. So it's going to be in the bioactivity prediction app from one of the prior repository. And let me go back up one folder and here in the app. So in the app.py, we're going to have to run the bash command shown here, which is quite long, right? So we're gonna use the Java and then we're gonna specify that we wanna use two gigabytes. And then we're gonna specify that we won't need to have the GUI version. And then we're gonna specify the path to the jar file. And then we're gonna specify all of the options here, like remove salt, standardized nitro group. And then we're going to calculate the fingerprints. We're going to use the descriptor type to be PubChem fingerprint and then we're going to write it out in the present folder and then the file name will be descriptor output.csv. So all of this will actually be done here right inside the Google Colab using the native Python but under the hood, it is using the Java as well. And so we don't have to deal manually with using the bash command in order to run the Java. So all of that will be done by the PaddlePy library, okay? And so here we're gonna import the Paddle descriptor function from PaddlePy library. And whenever you wanna calculate a molecular fingerprint, you're going to specify the key here, okay? So PubChem, we're gonna specify PubChem here if we wanna calculate PubChem. But if we want to calculate another descriptor, like substructure, we're going to replace it here, like this, substructure. Okay, so let's just use substructure for now. And then in the following lines of code here, this will tell us the output file, right? So it will use substructure, which is assigned to the fingerprint variable, which is this one. And then we're going to create the substructure.csv file because we use the join command. And so the name of the output file will then become substructure.csv because we could have manually typed in substructure.csv right here, okay? So we could have typed in like this, substructure.csv instead of using this variable, okay? We could have typed in here. 
And then the fingerprint descriptor types, we could have typed in, as shown here, descriptor types to be substructure fingerprint counts. So let's make that account then count. Okay, because it looks like this one and let's modify that as well and so the descriptor types here will be the substructure count dot xml as shown here all right and the other options that i've told you just a moment ago we're going to specify it here like the detect aromaticity to be true standardized nitro group to be true standardized the tautomer to be true and we're going to use two threads for the calculation remove salt to be true and we also want to have it generate the block file and we're going to calculate the fingerprints okay and let's run this and so this should take quite some time because we have about 500 molecules all right and so after one minute and 36 seconds it has completed the calculation of the substructure descriptor so let's have a look let's read in the output file because the generated output file will go to the substructure count dot csv file and in order to see that let's click on the icon of the folder here and it's going to be in here let's see which one did we use we use oh okay so I, I typed in here to be in the comments substructure count but actually we're using substructure okay so this would have to be like this let me modify the comments so as shown in green it's in the hashtag so these are the comments so just a moment ago i typed in the wrong comments for the name of the file that is supposed to be if you would like to do it traditionally manually so here we specify fingerprint to be substructure so it has calculated the substructure and it is using the xml file shown here in the substructure fingerprinter.xml and so you're going to notice that the output file will be here substructure.csv and then the log file will be here substructure.csv.log let's have a look at the log file and you're going to see that the files are processed and it's written out to the log file so there should be about 579 578 okay so there's 578 molecules and it says descriptor calculation completed all right so whenever it is successfully computed you will see this line descriptor calculation completed okay otherwise you're going to see some error message and let's have a look at the descriptor file here let's double click on it and it's going to show up here all right and so it's spanning many pages okay and so we're going to read it in let me minimize this first now we're going to read it into the data frame using the read csv function and there you go 578 rows and 308 columns because there are the substructure fingerprints 308 columns of that and then the first column here is the name of the jumbo id and so why don't we go ahead and build a classification model so first thing is to drop this first column so we drop the name column and then we're going to assign the remaining data frame here it has only the descriptor we're going to assign that to the x variable and then for the y variable we're going to assign the activity column so the activity column shown above here here let me show you to the right the activity column right here so it's going to be categorical active or inactive and so we're going to build a classification model so let's run it so now we have the x and y's and then we're going to perform a low variance feature removal because initially we have about 308 columns and you can see that the data is quite sparse and so let's see how many features we could remove from here all right and so quite a lot of features were removed using the threshold so we have 18 columns left okay so out of 308 about 290 were removed and we use the threshold 0.1 so the threshold of 0.1 means that whenever we have variance near zero or less than 0.1 we're going to delete those columns because it might be the case that the columns here will contain near constant values, meaning that all of it could be ones or all of it could almost be all zeros. So they're going to be low variance. And so it's not going to provide meaningful information. Therefore, we will drop those columns. All right. And so we have finally 18 columns. And so let's now perform the data split. So we have 578 rows or 578 compounds. And upon doing the data split let's see how many we have so let me use extreme dot shape and then x test dot shape let's have a look so we have 
the dimensions of the X train and X test. So the training set has now 462 compounds and the test set now has 116 compounds because here we're using the 80-20 split. So 20% goes to the test set, 80% goes to the training set. So actually, see, I should set seat number, random state. All right, I'm going to use random state 42. So it will be reproducible. Let me do it again. All right, and now we're going to build the random forest model. So an estimator will be using a value of 500. And now we're going to perform model fits using X train and Y train as the input argument. Then we're going to apply the train model stored in the model variable here to make a prediction on the original data set that was used to train the model. And then we're going to assign it to Y train pred variable. And then we're going to apply the model, which was trained on the training set. Now this time to make a prediction on the testing set. And then we're going to store it inside the Y test pred variable. Let's run it. All right. And now we're going to calculate the model performance metric using the Matthews correlation coefficients. And so as input argument, we're going to use the Y train and Y train pred for the MCC of the training set. And then we're going to use the Y test and Y test pred as the input argument for the MCC test. And so we could see here that we got the training set MCC to be 0 0.83 and the MCC for the test set to be 0 0.52. So the performance of the test set is above 0 0.5. So it looks to be quite reasonably good. And the cross validation, let's run it. And so we see that the cross validation score from five fold has values shown here in this list. And now we're going to calculate the mean value from the five trials of the five fold and we get 0 0.84. 0.846. Okay. And then we're going to combine all of the values for the MCC train, MCC test, and MCC CV into the same data frame. And so first we're going to convert all of the mentioned variables, MCC train, MCC CV, MCC test into a panda series data format. And then we're going to use it to combine it using the pd.concat function. And then finally, we're going to assign it to the performance metrics variable. And so there you have it, the performance metrics for the random forest model. And so you could iterate the same approach for other machine learning algorithms, and then you could store it in the same table in order for you to perform a comparison between the model performance as a function of the machine learning algorithms. And so let me know in the comments down below which algorithms did you compare this with. And if you're finding value out of this video, please support the channel by liking it, subscribing if you haven't already, and make sure to hit on the notification bell so that you will be notified of the next video. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey.